Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for Saturday, July 2nd, uh, main event at Asanya versus Kanemir. It was uh, Lauren Murphy, Misha Tate, but that got scrapped, which means we're going to have only a 12 fight card. And in the 12, in the 12 fight card, um, normally I would say that it's not quite as important to look for insane upside, that you know, getting six winners might almost be good enough. Um, whether this card kind of falls in line with that remains to be seen because you have two five round fights, which have an incredible floor with respect to scoring. So on the one hand, yes, 12 fights, usually you don't need a zillion points, but when you have these two five round fights, uh, you have to, you have to wonder, uh, if you still need a lot of upside, because you really, you might in those you know, in those other non five round fights. So we're going to go through it kind of uh, fight by fight here. And there are some good spots. There are some decent fades and we're going to just do it the same way we always do. We're going to, you know, try to find fighters, which either have uh, good win equity. In other words, maybe they're mispriced for some reason, maybe due to a replacement fighter situation or, uh, the salaries came out before big line movement. Second, we're looking for fighters with uh, hopefully good, either good grappling or wrestling upside because draft teams rewards that, um, or uh, a good uh, a good finishing prop, uh, just a decent likelihood that they that they uh, they get a KO or a submission, because obviously DraftKings scores that really well. And in the absence of that, uh, the last resort we could find fighters which have an insane amount of volume. Um, cause that does add up in, in some situations and we'll look at the context of the slate and see if we can't figure out a good way to approach this. So first of all, first fight of the night, you have, uh, Jessica Rose Clark against Julius Stolyarenko. And this is a very interesting fight from a style perspective. Um, when you just look at the, um, at the inside the distance prop, it doesn't look very promising. You have a uh, minus 200 fight goes to decision. And normally we don't want to deal with fights that have that um, unless one fighter has an incredible amount of upside for some reason. And what's interesting here is that both of these fighters are going to consent to a style of fight, which if it works for them is going to probably have them score well. Um, follow it this way. So Jessica Rose Clark is probably going to try to get takedowns and you know, control time and things like that. Um, she attempted to do that against someone much better than her at that in her last fight. So I think she'll be able to realize that that, you know, that was the reason why it didn't work out. And she is going to probably attempt to, to employ that type of game plan. And as I just kind of reviewed, that type of game plan, if executed properly and effectively, usually is conducive to good drafting scoring. On the other hand, you have Julius Stolyarenko, who... Is not um, is not shy about letting herself get taken to the ground, and one of the reasons why is she has a very strong submission game. She looks for arm bars kind of all the time in you know in those types of positions, and you also factor in the fact that Jessica Rose Clark uh, has been submitted in in such a in such a manner before. It lends itself to a situation where both fighters are going to consent to exactly what the other one might need. Okay. And you follow this. So Jessica Rose Clark's going to be, you know, I really want to take you to the ground. And Julie is going to say, okay, that sounds good to me because I'm going to try to submit you when you do that. So it's a weird situation in that I think that if either fighter wins, they are, you know, she is, uh, they are going to score well. If either fighter wins, she is going to score very, very well. And if you look at the the price, um, where is the draft? My draft tickets. Situation here. Is it here? No. So when you look at the prices here, you have 8,600 and 7,600. That's pretty reasonable, you know, for both fighters. So I really, uh, I think this fight in, you know, despite being the first fight of the night is, is pretty, uh, is pretty solid um, from a DFS perspective. And I would probably get a kind of a, uh, an equity weighted amount of both fighters, meaning that you do have Stoliarenko who, is probably three to two to win. So I'd probably get 60%, excuse me, that's slowly. Uh, Jessica Rose Clark 
probably 60% of her and 40% of, of, of Stoli Renko, if I were going to key this fight completely, if I were going to play 50% of this fight, I would play you know, 30% Clark, 20% Stoli Renko. I'd be very content with that. Now, again, this is not really factoring in ownership quite yet um, because it's still due to come in. But um, this is uh, right off the bat. This is a fight which is might honestly go under the radar. It's only 12 fights. But uh, I think this, uh, from a win condition perspective, this fight does rate the score well for whoever wins. Uh, as opposed to this next fight, Macy Barber against Jessica I, this is one which I am completely fading. Um, you have Jessica I, well, Macy Barber, she is a three to one favorite, so she's probably going to win. But at 9,200, I mean, or 9,100, you're going to need her to score well to pay that off, which means you really need her to get a finish or have an incredible amount of grappling upside. And according to Vegas lines, what they're implying, she has neither. You know, you, the fight doesn't go to decision prop is like minus 250. And that is pretty brutal, okay, um, for someone who's 9,100, who doesn't have all that much grappling and wrestling upside. So for me, I think Macy Barber is, is a complete fade in the spot. And Jessica I, unfortunately, just doesn't have the win condition. You know, and not, 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 not only that, you know, she's plus 230 to win. I mean, she's only going to win this fight, what, 25% of the time, something like that? 20, you know, maybe not, no, maybe not that bad, like 30% of the time. So I, I just don't feel as though she has enough win equity to make this worth her while. So I'm probably going to fade, full fade Macy Barber. Jessica I actually... Um, if I play 150, I'll probably get to some of her because again, you're going to need some underdogs and, and you can't be that great. Like if, if, if you do get a win out of her in a decision somehow, even though it might only be 60 points at 7,100, maybe that might be worth it. So, um, Macy Barber, I will almost definitely have zero of and Jessica. I maybe have a sprinkle. Uh, this next fight is uh, extremely interesting. You have Brad Tavares against uh, Dricus Duplessis. And you look at the numbers here. First of all, you have, I mean, you have pretty much everything that you want in, uh, in a uh, GPP play. Well, with the exception of one thing, which we'll get to, in Dricus Duplessis. I mean, you look at him, he's, he's a minus 150 favorite. And uh, because I guess this line moved recently um sorry about this wrong spot here um duplices is priced as an underdog duplices is priced at at 8k and that is a disaster okay so you have someone priced as a, an underdog who is a 150 favorite that's already puts him in kind of theoretical lock territory um the other thing is that you have all of the of the finishing upside in his favor. Like you look at this, you have an inside the distance prop of minus 150, which is not the greatest, but it's pretty good. And if you look at where that kind of comes from, um, Tavares is kind of known as as the kids in the MMA like to say a decisioning. I mean, he likes to he gets a lot of decisions. And if you look at how this breaks down, you have Plesis winning inside the distance is only a plus 130. Yikes. You know, compared to Tavares is plus 450. This is extremely strong um, for Plesis, for Duplesis. So the combination of that plus the win equity, I mean, this makes this play just almost a lock. Now, but when you think about what this means, though, right, he's still only, you know, going to win the fight 60% of the time. So 40% of the time, at least, at least 40% of them, this fight, you know, his side busts. But from a math perspective, I mean, he's just as, I mean, it really is as good as it gets here. The only thing I would say is that what, what keeps it not a perfect GPP play is going to be ownership. You know, I, I imagine that he's got to be. I would like to say 50% owned because of everything I just said, but I've, I've seen it. I've seen it in the last year, fighters with this exact situation go only 35% when they really should be 70, you know? So uh, that's, that's where I'm at. I think Duplice is in, in, listen, in cash games is the first play, is the first fighter you should put in. And I'm going to continue to monitor ownership. And if I see it's only coming in at say 30%, I'm going to go, I'm going to be significantly over the field on him regardless. Um, but, you know, I think it's, 
this is a perfect example of, of a uh, fighter that you want to fight you know, in DFS. Not that you want to fight, that you want to play in DFS. Um, okay, moving up, I guess, up the card. Um, Uriah Hall versus Andre Muniz. So this is a... Uh, this is the first of, well, the second of uh, the 9K fighters we have to talk about. First, we talked about Macy Barber, Colossal Fade. Then you have Andre Muniz, who is, uh, he's a minus 330 favorite, uh, if you look at his side. Um, and not only that, you have an inside of distance prop where you have him at, what is it, a minus 200? Let's just see. It says Muniz wins by... Unis winning inside the distance. I think it's minus 200. Let's take a look. Uh, yeah, so he's minus 200 to win inside the distance. Um, that's rough. You know, that, that, that's, that's a rough thing to fade. Um, and if you are going to fade it, this is the only couple of couple of things uh, i'll give you a couple of couple of, of possibilities of why you might want to fade it number one is that he is a submission expert so it's possible that he gets just one takedown followed by a submission and even in a first round submission it only scores like a hundred you know because he's not the kind of guy that's going to do a lot of ground and pound and like kind of like pile it on you know if he really outclasses uriah hall He'll get one takedown submission, 95 points and, and, or whatever, 98 points. And if you, if you, if you, uh, if you have him at 9,200, are you, are you happy? Um, maybe, but think about it another way. If, 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 if he survives even that first round and goes to a second round, now your submission is only going to get you 70. And even if you get two takedowns in the middle, you know, how how big is your score really you know so that's the only thing i would say about the muni side is that if other fighters really put up scores he might not even score well enough to to be in the optimal even if he gets a finish um and the other thing i would say is that hall you know he's not as not a complete garbage can i mean he's got he's got wins he's he's got tricks you know he's I don't know, Muniz is kind of like the hot shot that's coming up now, but I mean, Hall is, you know, he's got some W's and he knows what Muniz is going to try to do. And if, if Hall is, you know, Hall's a striker and strikers have been trying to deal with wrestlers, you know, their whole career. So he's going to try, he's going to try to keep him off his ass and, and try to keep this a striking bat. And I'll tell you this, if he can do it, I promise you that Muniz bus bus hard. But I do think that at least listen, relative to the, to Barber, not Barber. Uh, yeah, relative to Barber, Uniz is clearly a better play. I mean, minus 200 inside the distance problem. That is kind of tough to fade. The other thing is that it is a 12 fight slate. So maybe 95 or 100 is just plenty. Um, so I guess overall, I would consider Muniz a good play. Um, I don't think it's something you have to lock in or anything like that, but I do think it's a good play. And the reason why I mentioned I don't think you have to lock it in is there are other, there are other variations on this slate that we're going to get to that maybe will make you not want to play. I'm not sure. Let's take a look. So the next fight, which I, I boy, I, I can't imagine this one not being highly owned. We'll take a look at it. Is Jim Miller versus uh, Donald Cerrone. Um, now he's had some fight can fights canceled Cerrone. So just, just be on the lookout for, for stuff like that. Um, you look at the inside the distance prop here and you have, uh, a fight doesn't go to decision minus 200. And then you also have, and that's really, really strong, obviously. And then you have Miller winning inside the distance of about a pick, which is really, which is pretty good. You know, he's basically pick him to, to get the finish here. And if you look at the price tag, he's much more reasonable than the same Muniz, right? So, so his price tag is... Was it 88? Um, yeah, he is 8,700. So that's a big deal. You know, um, is that, does that make up for the, you know, the, the, I guess, relatively worse inside the distance prop, right? 
Um, you have Muniz minus 200 versus Miller's pickup. Um, but one's got 500 less. I think they are very, I think they are very similar. Okay. Um, now, again, since we're going over this, if you wanted a reason to fade uh, Jim Miller, which you can come up with, is that Cerrone has been having to fight uh, below his, his normal weight uh, several times. And he is um, now at a, at a more reasonable weight class. Um, uh, but that's all factored into that price already. Okay. I don't think that my saying that is something that is say, ooh, I know it's one's minus 195, but maybe they're not considering this. They are. I mean, everybody's considering that. So um, I feel as though the Miller is a good play. Um, I, I think he's very similar to Muniz, given their relative price, given their relative upside and things like that. With respect to Cerrone, I went back and forth on whether to include him in my underdog pool. And I guess if I'm forced to get to somebody in that range, I will. But still, you know, when it comes to to fighters like this that are getting older, I just again, I might be saying something that that contradicts what I just said. Like I know the line says he's only plus one sixty, but I don't know, right? But let me just go back to the numbers then. Uh, I guess he's got to be considered an okay underdog. Okay. Not particularly poor, not particularly great. What I'd love to do is not have to play him. I would much rather play someone like Stolyarenko, right? Who I know has the win condition. I know who I know is going to be put in a position to maybe execute that win position. You know, I'd much, obviously, much rather play Duplessis as an 8K, right? Um, but maybe you, you need to get to the 7,600. But we'll see. Uh, let's look at now Ian Gary versus Gabe Green, and this is a this is really interesting. Let's. I want to look at this fight compared to the Jim Miller fight. Okay. So the reason I mention it is they both have very similar, um, very similar price tags. You have, I think they're both, one of them is eighty seven hundred, and the other one is eighty eight hundred. Oops, I think I unshared my screen. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so you have Jim Miller, 8,700. And then you have, on the other hand, Ian Gary, 8,800. Okay, so Ian Gary is priced higher. And look at the relative inside the distance props. This is, this is, a, this is interesting. So Ian Gary, first of all, the fights inside the distance prop is about a pick em. And you look for his actual inside the distance prop. Um, my Google is not responding for some reason. Um, Gary wins inside the distance is plus 200. So you have Jim Miller, who's a pickup to win inside the distance. Versus Ian Gary, who is a plus 200 twin inside the distance, and they are both the same price. Uh, unless Gary has significant grappling upside, which does not seem to be the case, um, this seems like a really easy decision. So I'll probably going to be full fading, if or really close at least, Ian Gary. Um, and with respect to Gabe Green uh, as an underdog, I mean, he's, a, he's plus 150-ish. He's priced pretty efficiently. His, you know, win condition is not particularly great, you know. So I consider him kind of like a uh, Cowboy Cerrone, just kind of a passable underdog that if I get to him, I'll get to him, but I'm not going to prioritize. Um, okay, Jalen Turner versus Brad Riddell. Very, I think this is a, a, a key fight to have on your on your cards here you have an inside the distance prop of minus 250 you have a um you have very favorable pricing as well um is this it's the eight not 8200 8k let's take a look at this it is uh yeah it's 8400 7800 so let's let's look at the way the inside the distance prop uh, pans out. I imagine that that the majority of it is going to be for Turner, but let's just see for sure. 
So you have Riddell wins inside the distance plus 270, Turner plus 100. So, so yeah, that's like basically a pick them. So Turner is considered like three times more likely to finish than Riddell. So, I mean, the fact that he's only you know, 600 more, uh, I think that Turner's clearly the A side of this fight. Um, however, um, Riddell plus 300, is that worth doing? I don't know. I think it's close. I think, again, look, I think it's a, it's just as good of an, of an underdog, if not better, than Cowboy Cerrone. As a matter of fact, that is the way I'm going to look at this. I think that he is a, is a better underdog than Cowboy Cerrone, uh, Riddell. So if I'm between Riddell and Cerrone, I will take Riddell. But I do think that Turner is an extremely strong play. It's got, I mean, look, compare it. It's basically similar to the Jim Miller prop, right? Plus 110, um, basically plus 110 to finish. And he's even cheaper than Jim Miller. So I would say Jalen Turner is even a stronger play. Not to mention the fact that Jalen Turner might have some grappling upside. So, yeah, I, I think Jalen Turner is an extremely strong play. Okay, uh, moving up, I guess, the card here. Brian Barbarena against Robbie Lawler. The only thing that makes this worth thinking about is the price because it's a, it was, I think it's like 82, 8K. But you look at the inside the distance prop, it's, it's pretty poor. It's minus 160 to go to decision. Um, and uh, it's probably to end up being a fade for me. But let's, let's just take a look. Let's just see if either of these guys, let's see if they can get to like even a plus – Maybe if it goes to plus 300. Yeah, I guess it's not bad. These guys are plus 350 or so to get KOs in this matchup. So I guess they're okay, but they're not nearly as good as, say, the Duplices play, not nearly as good as even the Jalen Turner play. You know, so uh, this is going to really going to be secondary for me. Um, let's take a look again. Let's go to the – yeah, Barbarina instead of this is plus 330. Lawler inside this is plus 330. That's that's rough. So this is I'm only going to get to this fight in in, in really serious MME builds. Uh, if I'm playing even 20 lineups, I don't I don't know if I'm gonna get to this. All right, let's get to the next 9200 ish fighter, and that would be Sean O'Malley. He is a minus 300, but comparing it to Muniz, who's also minus 300, here is the difference. So the difference here is the inside the distance prop. Um, if my screen would stop stalling, I would be able to show you that, well, just take my word for it. His inside the distance prop is much poorer than Andre Muniz, who is the same three to one favorite, okay? Um, he is probably only pick him to finish this fight because of the uh, the durability of the opponent. Let's take a look. You have O'Malley wins by TKO plus 140. You know, so it's basically a pick em, and it's basically a pick em to to finish. So on the surface, O'Malley is a is a much is a weaker play than you needs. The only thing I would say that that makes O'Malley interesting is a style thing in that you know, O'Malley is someone who puts up a lot of volume and Muniz is someone who can tend to give up a lot of volume. So you might get a, a lot of significant strikes to go along with your, say, third round KO, right? Whereas a, where in, in, you compare that to Muniz, Muniz, you might get, you know, a couple of takedowns to go with your third round finish if it doesn't finish early. That's why you could argue that O'Malley is similar to Muniz, but it's a it's it's tough. It's a tough sell. Um, I still think Muniz is slightly better than O'Malley, and yet I also feel is that you might not need to play O'Malley at all. Um, it's a good play, but it's not a a smash play. It's not like it's one of those or like those wrestlers who's going to ragdoll a guy for three rounds and then ground and pound him and get 130 points, right? If O'Malley's best, I think his best outcome is the one I said, like a big three rounds of pummeling followed by a late KO. 
Um, I don't think a first round KO is really in his repertoire because what Pedro Munoz does, he does a lot of leg kicks to keep you at range. So, uh, and he's, I don't think, I don't know if he's ever been KO'd. So, um, with that said, O'Malley is a good play. I think he's a little worse than Muniz and he might not need to be played at all, but we'll get to that when we talk about construction in a few. Uh, next fight for me is probably the most, uh, is, is, I don't want to say the easiest fight, but whatever. I mean, you, you want to get this one, I think. Um, and I actually have an opinion on this fight. God help me. So Pereira against Sean Strickland, uh, you have a pretty good insight. Well, very good inside the distance prop, almost minus 200. And here's the interesting part of this. You have their win condition is, is definitely different. Um, you have, look at the inside the distance prop. You have Pereira winning by TKO is plus 150. And you have Strickland winning by TKO is plus 350, right? The idea is that if Strickland wins, it's going to be hopefully for him by decision. And the reason why is because from what I've been reading and from what I've been hearing, he has a real clear path to victory here if he opts to, to you know, to go into the wrestling takedown uh, area. Um, Number one, he's pretty good at it. And number two, Pereira being a, a pure kickboxer, that's his weakness, you know? And he came in as a huge favorite in his first fight against Andreas Mikulitas and got taken down twice in the first round. Um, he just is not very good at, 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 at getting into that game. So if Strickland does decide to go that route, I think he could really just crush. Um, and Pereira, I mean, his win condition is, is dependent on Strickland not being able to do that. And if Strickland decides to go after him and, they have just kind of a slugfest. I mean, Pereira's a freaking, he's a world champion kickboxer. So he could probably get a first or second round KO out of this. So I think this fight is a, is a real, is a real crapshoot. And in a weird way, it depends on, wh on what Strickland decides to do. Um, but I will say that I have a lean here. I am actually leaning Sean Strickland. I, I, in the beginning of the week, I was actually considering going all in on him. Um, just because, I mean, how dumb does a guy have to be? to not realize that this is a clear path to victory for you. But from what I've seen, I mean, he's not exactly the most, you know, of sound mind and body, let's put it that way. And it's possible he just gets, gets, goes on tilt and just decides, you know what, screw him, screw his kickboxing. I'm just going to go after him. And, you know, if he does that, then he's going to, he's just going to get, he's going to get waxed. So I'm not going to go all in on him, but I'm going to certainly lean towards him. And I might actually bet him um, if I get him at minus 110 or something. I think Strickland's extremely strong play, but this fight in general is something you really want to get a hold of. However, for me and for my money, it's not nearly as important as getting this next one. Okay, so you have the you have the the two five round fights that remain, and you have Adesanya against Cannonier and and Volkanovski against Holloway. This Volkanovski Holloway fight, um, if this fight doesn't make the optimal, I will be not only I'll be surprised, but I will just applaud the the fighters who got enough points to keep, to keep this out of the lineup because these are two high level animals. Okay, like they they are awesome. Like Holloway set a I think a UFC record for significant strikes. I mean, he just brings it. Okay, and volume, 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 volume. He could do it over five rounds, and that those points over a five round fight. Those strikes just add the F up. And him at 7,100, I mean, wow, you just want that, okay? And then you have Volkanovski, who, if you saw his last fight, or even his last two fights, his last fight against against uh, against Korean Zombie, this guy's a beast. I mean, he has it all. I mean, he's incredible kicks, incredible striking, and he even showed takedowns too. So, I mean, you have high level and five rounds. This is just getting there. You know, I don't know exactly who's going to win, but you know what I'll say? I'll bet you Volkanovski wins about twice as often as Holloway, okay? Because that's what the odds say. So what I'm going to probably do, I'll probably get, you know, 66% Volkanovski, 33% Holloway, and away we go. Um, I really doubt I'm keeping this out of my lineups. It's just way too many rounds, way too much talent, way too much action for me to fade. Um. 
Adesanya Cannoneer as a five round fight. This, I think this definitely has a, um, I think a lower median. Let's put it that way. Um, I think that if Israel Adesanya gets his fight, um, it's going to be, you know, he'll be able to keep Cannoneer at range, pick him apart for five rounds, get a nice safe decision and probably score worse than Volkanovsky or Holloway, for example. Okay. Probably score worse than, than O'Malley, for example, uh, in a, in a three round decision. Well, will he, that's a good question. If both those guys, guys do, if both those guys go to decision, who outscores whom really? I don't, that is a good question. It doesn't it have to be out of Sonya though? Is it, I mean, is, is O'Malley really going to get that many more strikes over three rounds? If that goes to decision, I don't know. I, you know, at the beginning of the week, I was going to just fade the, the Cannoneer fight, but look at this. You have Adesanya Cannoneer as a pickup to go to decision. It's the same as the O'Malley fight, and they're the, basically the same price. Um, I mean, you know, Adesanya is a little bit more expensive, but and Adesanya is a minus 500. Maybe fading Adesanya is just stupid. You know, and don't forget this could finish. And Adesanya, he can he can get a bunch of strikes in before he finishes him. So, where I was originally going to consider fading Adesanya, I, I have this weird feeling that he's going to end up actually under owned, which is kind of bizarre. Um, so I, I am going to use him. Um, I'm not going to get to Cannonier. He's plus four hundred. It's just I know it's. Just, I know his 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 uh, he has a good win condition, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just being biased, but I've seen that Asanya. There's he's never not he's never getting him. I shouldn't say never. I mean he could, right? He's being priced. I mean he's not like a thousand to one, but he's this guy's freaking this guy's really really good at keeping people off his ass. I mean the only guy he couldn't was was uh, Lahovich. He was he was like thirty pounds more than he was, you know and. And if you told me Jared Kennedy was huge and was going to go for takedowns or something like that, that's one thing. But I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't see how Cannonier can can rack up enough points to win this. I, I don't know. I, so for me, it is going to be Adesanya. I am going to play him. Um, I'm going to predict that he's going to be lower owned than maybe he should be. So what does all this mean? I mean, what all this means is that is that. We haven't really found that many great underdogs. Um, but one that you definitely are just, just have to play as Holloway. I mean, you you could get Holloway into the optimal in a loss. I'm just telling you. Um, and and when you're saying will you stack the fight, you could you could do that too. But it's also possible that 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 Holloway out could he outscore Valinovsky in a loss? Volkanovski, no, probably not, but 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 this fight is one of those that I think could get both guys in the optimal. If Holloway goes after it and they really put up this sick volume, um, you just never know. So for me, kind of the key fights is that one, the Strickland fight, the uh, I mean, Turner's a really strong play. Um, let me just pause this a second. Sorry if I paused my wrap up there, but uh, I like Turner. He's a strong play. Probably the Miller is good. I'm probably I'll probably end up at the end fading Cerrone. Probably end up fading Gabe Green. Um, Muniz is a strong play. I'll probably end up fading Brad Tavares, um, even though he's going to be low owned. Duplice is just too strong. I'll probably end up fading Jessica I after all that. But I will definitely have the Stoliarenko. So as far as my live underdogs, it would be Stoli. I guess Stoliarenko. It would be Riddell. It would be, um, I guess, whoever the underdog is, the Strickland Pereira. I guess Strickland and Holloway. I think those are my those are my, those are my live underdogs. And uh, that will do it. Good luck, everybody. It should be a fun card.